Hey folks, we're uh, glad you joined us on YouTube and uh, we're studying the uh, last few chapters of John, Jesus' farewell address, looking at it uh, with Francis Chan on Right Now Media. And uh, we're discussing that in this group and trying to learn and get what Francis is trying to tell us. So we're glad you joined us here. Uh, let me let me ask you something. I've already thought about this because I looked at it. Uh, what's what is the best meal you've ever had? Now think about that a minute. The best meal you've ever had. I got I had two that come to mind. Uh, one of them was a steak dinner I had at uh, Chef's de France in uh, Epcot at Disney World in Florida. And it was uh, probably the best steak I've ever had. It was it was incredible. I can't even describe it, but uh, I thought I'd had good steaks, but this is something else. But I guess the best meal I ever had was at a place called NOLA in New Orleans, N-O-L-A, New Orleans, Louisiana, N-O-L-A. But it's, uh, oh, I can't remember. Who's that guy that, that says boom, you know, and that I can't think of that chef's name, whatever. He owns the place. And so uh, I was down there for a convention one time with my business partner. And we went over there and ate dinner. I had the, uh, I don't remember what the appetizer was, some kind of risotto thing, but I had soft shell crab for main course. It was, incredibly good never had soft shell crab before or since but i had some there it was really good and uh for dessert i had um uh, what is it? sweet potato ice cream sweet potato ice cream it's, it was incredible uh so anyway <laughs> That was the best meal I think I ever had, most tasty meal I ever had. Anybody else think of one that you had? And what made it the best? I think just being around with family. Uh, as a little kid, I had an aunt that she thought, you know, just old school and, and you didn't sit down to a meal without two or three different kinds of meats. And, you know, the table was overloaded. So you, it was like a smorgasbord, yeah. but uh, there was a yeah. lot of laughter and, and eating and, and just visiting. And that, that's what uh, made it remember <laughs> <laughs> remarkable. <laughs> Jan, I thought about that too after I was... I was really thinking about the food, but we've had holiday meals. Uh, my wife's a great cook, and we've had holiday meals that were incredible, outstanding, not only food-wise, but as you said, fellowship-wise. Uh, so the, the, the great food overloads our senses. You know, we get smell, taste, texture, the way it's presented, the looks on the plate, uh, even the atmosphere, as we said, the fellowship matters, and it can create a beautiful experience. So uh, we find a description here and invitation from Jesus to experience the Father, to experience God, actually to experience the Trinity. And it's a lot like a menu invites us to experience a meal. And um, in this session, Francis will show us how God made himself available to us through his spirit and how his present changes our everyday lives. I've got a, I just thought of something. Um, I have a fellow that is an old friend of mine. We used to go to church together. I do talk to him and um, occasionally. And his sister is very ill. He's uh, a little younger than me, 
uh, not much. He's, he's uh, you know, past middle age. And his sister is too, but she's not a believer. He is, but she's not. And she's very critically ill. She has been for several weeks now. And so he's been trying to present the gospel to her where she would accept it and listen and, uh, you know, be able to experience God. And one of the things he said just this week is that she just realized the closeness of God. In other words, her, her thought of God beforehand has been a distant God that somewhere out there, creator, couldn't have a relationship with him. Just, he was there, I was here, wasn't impossible. And suddenly she's seen, actually by reading the Gospel of John, that, that there is the opportunity for her to be close to God, to have a relationship with him. And that's been pretty profound to her. So this guy was encouraged that she was beginning to realize that. And so I hope, I hope we do the same thing because God, he asks us, he desires, he aches for us to be personal with him. He wants to know, he wants us to know him the way he knows us, okay? And this, remember, this is the God who created you. He put everything about you together. He made you what you are. So he understands everything. But he wants you to know him the same way. A, a passage in the Old Testament said that, that it's God intends to be mysterious. That's what he wants to do. But he intends for you to search him out. Okay, the, the elite uh, people, the rulers, the kings, search him out. And we are that. Okay, we are the people who would search him and know him. So we're going to look at this video here in a minute uh, called God With Us. God With Us. And I want you to think about... Um, uh, who, uh, these questions, <clears throat> excuse me, whom did Jesus send after he left his disciples? And what does it mean to be indwelt by God? And then why is it important to obey God's commands? Those three questions. Whom did Jesus send after he left his disciples? What does it mean to be indwelt by God? And why is it important to obey God's commands? So let's, let's listen to the video, listen to Francis about 10 minutes here, and then we'll talk about it a little bit. Oh, just a minute. Hang on just a minute. Mm -hmm. Can you hear it and see it? Wave at me. See it, Jennifer? Okay. to learn how to read this book more like the way we read a menu. In other words, you don't ever read a menu just to know what's on there or to memorize it. The, the whole point of a menu is that it's supposed to lead you to something. You, you read what you want and then you, you look at the server and you go, you, you know what, I, I want to taste this. I want to eat this. This is what I want. I've got, and, and this book, you know, too many people just read it and, and just leave it at that. 
Like, I get it. I understand it. I know what's in there, but this was to take us somewhere. It was so that we could experience something and, and to taste something. And especially as we get into this section in John 14, this is for us to experience. So don't just grab this as information. Because remember, we, we ended the, the last section where, where Jesus says, whoever believes in me will do the works that I do and greater works in these. Okay, so we're supposed to read that and go, God, I want that. I, 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 want, I want to taste that. I want to taste doing the things that you did. I want to taste doing greater works than that. What, what is that like? I want to order this. And, and, and in the next section, he explains how you do it. How is it that we would be able to do the same works as Jesus and greater works than those? Verse 16, Jesus says, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. This is where Jesus introduces to the disciples the concept that when he leaves the earth, He's going to send the Spirit in a way that He can actually dwell in us. The disciples had experienced the power of the Spirit, but now Jesus is saying He can be in you. He will be in you. You guys, do not normalize the Spirit entering you. In other words, even though you've heard it your whole life, those of you who've been in the, a part of the church, that, oh, God's Spirit is in you, you guys, take some time to think about that phrase. You're talking about holy God entering your body. Don't make that a normal thing. Jesus says, this is why you're going to be able to do the things I did, and even greater things, is the end, indwelling of God himself. And then he goes on and he says some fascinating things. In verse 21, he says this, Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him, and manifest myself to him. Okay, what does that mean? He goes, if you keep my commandments, you'll be loved by my Father. And, and, and he makes this statement that I will love him and manifest myself to him. Have you ever tasted of that? where Jesus manifests himself to you. That word manifest means reveal. Has he revealed himself to you? See, this is why I'm saying, get alone with these words. Would Jesus really manifest himself in some way? And I'm not saying I understand what this means completely. That's why I'm saying I want to know this. And he goes on in verse 23, Jesus says, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. First of all, remember, this is conditional. He says, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. So it's, it's if we are loving Jesus, then we will obey his command 
his command to love one another, all the commands he's given us, we show our love by our obedience. But he says, when you, if you love me, he says, my father and I will make our home with you. I hope that phrase has not become normal to you. The thought that the father and son will make their home with you. And he continues in verse 25. He says, these things I've spoken to you while I'm still with you, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. He says, look, when I leave, you're going to have this experience. Okay? He's not just telling them so that they know, and go, okay, I know this, I know this. No, he says you're going to experience this where the Spirit will actually teach you. He'll lead you into all truth. And so I'm asking you, man, have you tasted of this? Just be honest and come before God and say, God, I don't know if I really know what this means. I want to know what it means when it says that, that Jesus would manifest himself to me. God, I want that. I want to taste that. I want to know what it means when it says that your spirit will lead me. He'll teach me all things. I want to know these things. I want to experience the Father and the Son living with me, making their home with me. Let's get deep in our prayer lives. These things don't happen as you're driving through the drive through and throwing up a quick prayer to God or, or just, you know, as you're brushing your teeth saying, God, thank you for the... It's about saying, God, I want to know these things. I want you to take me higher. I want you to take me in your presence and I want to experience every bit of this that I can. Okay. Y'all, this is uh, what we're hearing in these lessons is uh, how can I say it? It's a plea and I, I second it. I agree with what Francis is saying, I think that too often, most of us, maybe all of us, discount in a way what the scripture is trying to say, what, what God is trying to say to us through the Bible. And in other ways, but especially the Bible. Uh, again, I've, I've told you this before, but my testimony is for most of my life, I had the idea that there was something, there was a debt uh, a deal, uh, a payment that I owed to God, and it was called obedience. Okay, so what I heard at church, went to church from the day I was born. Okay. 
what I heard that was was came out of the mouth, spoken, maybe intentionally, maybe not. I don't want to blame somebody. But what I heard was you, Bobby Haney, you need to obey. You, in other words, you need to be a certain kind of person. I was a Baptist, so that meant uh, you don't dance, you don't drink, you don't smoke, uh, you, you pray, you go to church, you give your money, you know, those kind of things. I was supposed to be obedient, be a good boy, do the right things, Bobby. And then when I did that, God would bless me. He would do good things for me and to me if I obeyed. This passage right here. If you love me, you'll obey me. So what that, that sounds like, well, oh, sorry. Well, what happened was I didn't obey all the time. You know, I was pretty good. I was a pretty nice guy. I think most of us are. There's some bad guys. We know them. A lot of them go to jail. <laughs> some of them don't. But they don't behave. I behaved. But I didn't quite do everything right. I misbehaved sometimes. And so that meant, to my mind, that God was holding back because I was disobeying. Not because he didn't want to, but I was disobeying, so he had to hold back. Could be anything. Could be holding back blessings. He might be holding back heaven from me. I, I didn't know. I wasn't sure. Okay. But that's what I thought. You see? You see what I'm saying? Okay. And then I realized, and still haven't, I must admit, I haven't quite gotten it, but I understand the concept. God paid all the debt. I don't owe him anything. I don't owe him a payment. I don't owe him my behavior. I, I don't owe him anything. Now, that doesn't mean I'm on my own. That doesn't mean God's over here and I'm over here. That doesn't mean that. Some people think it does. No, no. What that means is I don't owe him anything because he already paid it. He already paid it. Now, that blows my mind, folks. You know, we don't operate like that on earth. Nobody else does that. Nobody that I know does that, including me. But God did. Everything is paid. God says, you don't owe me anything, buddy. Now, what that should produce in me, what that should conjure in me, if I could overcome the, the things I've learned and practiced and done, if I could overcome that somehow and see that God has paid it all, total grace. That's the term you've heard, complete grace. God paid it all. I don't owe anything. God paid it all. Then my reaction should be, oh my, I'm stunned. I'm floored. I, I give up. I quit. 
You've done it all, God. I'm totally dependent, indebted, everything to you. And what that would do if I was able to do that, and I fail at it still, what that would do is produce, because of love, because of gratitude, because of what happened, then that would produce produce that complete obedience to him. That thing that I've been trying to do would happen because my attitude changed about what he'd done. That, that would open the door to experiencing the Holy Spirit in me, which is who Jesus sent in his place. By the way, the Holy Spirit is an exact copy, so to speak, of Christ. It's exactly the same way. He's exactly as loving and forgiving and healing and wonderful, astoundingly wonderful as Jesus is. Okay, and I think that, at least for me, and I think maybe others too, we, we've kind of, I don't know what the word is, we kind of think of the Holy Spirit as weird. You know, Father, okay, we may, we get that concept of the Father. We may not have had a good experience with the Father. We may have trouble with reconciling that idea, but we get father, we get son, son, father and son. Yeah, I know what that is. I see that. I have an example of that. It's not perfect, but I, but I see that concept. And then we got the Holy Spirit, which is weird. I, I don't have a concept of the spirit like I do the father and the son. So it's harder for me to relate to the Holy Spirit. And what has happened is we get a lot of things attached to the Holy Spirit that makes it harder to relate to him. When it should be pretty simple. Okay. I don't want to get off on that, but there's some difficulty, I think, there. But the fact is, supernaturally, we, don't, we can't figure this out, okay? Supernaturally, the Holy Spirit is sent to live in us. You remember a few weeks ago when we talked about the parts of the human and the makeup and all those things that we were talking about being reconciled to God. The Holy Spirit indwells that area, not necessarily conscious. It includes it, but it's not just consciously, but it's every way. Okay. So the Holy Spirit supernaturally comes to bring the presence. Remember, I said he was the exact replica of Jesus, who's the exact replica of God, right? He comes to live in us. Boom. So can't, can't explain it to you. Don't know how it works, but I want to, just like Francis said, I want to, and I hope you do, get to the point where that's a normal feeling for me, quote unquote feeling. That's a normal situation for me. Make sense? Hope it does. Um, yeah, yeah, obedience again. Obedience can be a scary word. 
Uh, it is to me, maybe it is to you. But hey, look, I, I'm an American man. I don't have to, I don't have to do what you tell me to do. I'm free, I'm independent, I'm smart, I'm whatever. Okay. Educated. I got all that stuff. Rich, whatever. Richer than 98% of the world Americans are. Or I don't know. You know, we're rich anyway. So we have advantages. So I don't I don't need for you to tell me what to do. And I'm afraid that attitude also goes toward the Bible, toward God. And we think, we might say it, it's ugly to say it. Oh my goodness, don't say it. That'd be terrible. But we actually think it and we live it. When the Bible says, this is how it should be done, we're going, hey, you don't tell me what to do. You know, I'm American, by golly. So don't tell me what's right and wrong. It's like Republicans and Democrats, you know. One says, you don't tell me how to do it. The other side says, you don't tell me how to do it. I'm right, you're not. That's, that's the way we do, way inside maybe, but that's the, what we do to God. And so he's, he's prevented, he gives us a chance to do that, but it prevents him from doing what he'd like to do. That makes sense? You understand what I mean? So we have this, we have this spirit in us, which we, which we accepted, but we, we disallow it to operate too often. We disallow it to operate the way it should. Anybody have any questions, comments on that? Now, I, I thought there's much more to this, but I think I'll, let's just talk about one more point. The, the importance of letting the spirit work is not only uh, a personal thing, it's not only so that I can be blessed, so that I can have peace, all of which is available. I can have joy in the middle of bad circumstances. I can still be joyful. Uh, I can have blessing that, that is amazing. And I'm not talking about being blessed materially or physically necessarily. I'm not saying, you know, this blessing means, oh, you're going to be rich and you're going to be healthy. And I'll, no, 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 no. Those are those are nothing, really. The blessing is spiritual blessing, that deep seated, overriding joy and peace and wisdom, comfort. Those are things that. God wants to give us through his spirit. Those are the things that I allow or disallow by my attitude about it, okay? Again, not I don't allow and disallow by acting nice or not acting nice. That, that kind of stuff just occurs because of the attitude of my heart. If I am independent, selfish, non-trustworthy, and make choices like that, I'm not allowing the Spirit, and I won't be obedient. If I do allow the Spirit to work, if I love God, trust Him, then those good things will come out of me. And that's the that's reason. Another reason, not just because it helps us, 
but because when we do that, we are influential in positive ways to other people, to the world. Okay. So we got to think about that a minute, folks. How, how influential are you to things and people that go on around you? Now, you may think, oh, I'm nobody. I don't, I'm not a big time preacher. I'm not a politician. I'm not uh, famous. I'm not popular. All right. But I'll, I'll tell you what, you can be exactly what God wants you to be. And you can influence more than you think probably, and, and you do, all right, I'm, I'm a teacher of a Bible study. I have influence somewhat over you folks that are on here. I have influence more or less on my family. I have influence on other people who don't join us here, who are friends of mine, just like they have influence on me. I have influence on them. Uh, you have influence on people you interact with on your job. Jennifer, Jennifer has a job that she influences people. She may not consciously do it, but she's doing it. And she may consciously do it. The, Dakota has a business. She has clients that she influences for good or bad. She influences them. Bryant works has coworkers. Okay, I'm retired, but I have people in my life who still contact me, who still listen to me, who receive emails from me, texts from me, lots of things where there's influence traded. So it is important that my uh, what would, you, what would you call it? Motivation or the energy for the influence I'm handing out or is going out is from God, okay? In other words, I want God to bless me and I want God to use me to bless others. Just like I told you a few minutes ago, this, this man I know whose sister is real sick, she's a non-believer, but he is influencing her by reading the gospel of John to her, okay? I'm sure he has many times in his life, he has witnessed to her. He has shared uh, scripture with her. He shared Jesus with her. She's turned it down and turned it down and turned it down. He could have said, all right, I give up. But he's taking this, reading this book of John to her, and it's changing her attitude. So our, our receiving this Holy Spirit should also be, the reason for receiving should also be so that we can influence others positively. And I've said to you guys so many times in the last few weeks, I'm so troubled by the state of our culture, okay? We're, we're just, you know, we can, we're griping about, oh my goodness, why do we, how are we letting this people get away with this and that? And this is against the Bible and blah, blah, blah. And griping is one thing, but actually influencing people to listen to the gospel, to listen to scripture, to live scripture, we have to exemplify it. Not just say it, we have to live it in front of them. Show them the blessing that we get from that. 
rather than tell them, hey, you need to do this so you'll be blessed. Oh, don't tell me what to do. Remember that? <laughs> Nobody's listening to you tell them what to do. But they are watching how you and I are living this out. Are we filled with the Spirit? Do we listen to the Spirit in His direction? Another, another thing I see in, sometimes in these uh, prayer texts, people say, oh, I need to know what the Lord wants me to do. And, and I wonder sometimes, they'll, they may say this week after week after week, I need direction from God. I need to know what to do. I, I wonder if God isn't saying it to them and they're just not hearing it. I've experienced that. Okay. Many times, God's told me exactly what to do, and I'm still sitting here going, I wish God would tell me what to do, and I'm just not hearing what he's saying. You ever done that? So we need to listen to what God has to say, and then let it flow out. Let it come out. Let obedience come out from us as our attitude changes. Uh, Romans, uh, excuse me, First Corinthians, I can't remember where it is, uh, talks about renewing your mind. Renew your mind. Don't, don't be that person that you've always been saying, well, I'm, I, you can't tell me what to do. I know better than you. Okay, that's not, that's not a Christ-like attitude. That's my attitude personal, selfish. The Spirit will change my attitude if I will let him, which will change my mind. Remember. Okay, you guys, I, 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 I'm going to echo again what Francis is telling us is that if you will Look at these chapters in John, chapter 13 through chapter 17. John, Gospel of John, 13 through 17. And really meditate, listen, ask questions, talk to God about what you're reading. And, and he will supernaturally, supernaturally reveal to you what this means, and it's it's such a big deal. I hope you'll do it. So again, uh, I sent you this uh, PDF that includes this uh, going deeper part of this, and I encourage you to do that. Uh, this will help you go through these verses and these passages um, to do to do that. So um, I wrote down this question uh, that I'll, I'll kind of leave this with you. I already said it, but do, do you, me, do I reveal God's goodness? Now, what is available is what I talked about at the very beginning, but do we have it? And do we reveal it? So I think we need to think about that. If, if you know, I, I can't help but think if enough of us did that, we could change the world. You know, that's not unprecedented. It happened once upon a time. <laughs> it's happened many times. In our country, in our culture, uh, I'm afraid it's going the other way, but the answer may be in the question, do we reveal God's goodness? Or are we more interested in revealing God's judgment? You know, so let's be careful about that. Let's, let's get in touch with our, our, the Holy Spirit who's filled us, who Jesus sent, and it's filled us, and we, we can be able to do that.
Anybody have any questions, comments? It says, I got a, this says here on this handout, Jesus has not left us to figure out life by ourselves. We don't have to struggle uh, through trial and error, it says, to find the truth. We have the Holy Spirit in us, revealing truth and guiding us. The, the question is, are we willing to submit and trust that that's the right way? That's our basic problem. Anybody else? Folks, remember that um, next Sunday, November 6th, is uh, it's two things. It's time change Sunday. Set your clocks back. And it's also our first face-to-face uh, -face meeting at our house here in Bristol. The address is 451 Old Gen Road. And it's, it's in Ennis. If you Google that, It'll show you how to get here. Uh, so 451 Old Gen Road, Ennis, the zip code is 75119. We're not, we're actually about 10 miles from Ennis, but that's our post office area. This is our, uh, that's our 911 address, you know, postal address. So uh, we look forward to seeing you at nine. We'll have something to eat. Uh, we'll study uh, John some more, or, or maybe we'll talk about what we want to do when we get together. We'll kind of leave it open to see what happens, but uh, we might can do part four of John. We'll, we'll see how we do, see what's going on. Anybody have any other questions? Let me, let me send you out. May the Lord bless you and protect you. Yes. May the Lord's face radiate with joy because of you. May he be gracious to you, show you his favor, and give you his peace. His peace. How many would like to have God's peace in their life. I would, my hand's up. <laughs> okay. So you have that opportunity and he wants to give it to you. So I pray that for you now. All right, folks. Love you guys. We'll see you next Sunday, hopefully here. And uh, uh, have a great week. Love you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.